Hello friends, let us look at the poem Inverse Need by G.M. Hopkins. When we talk about nature poets, the names that come to our minds are usually that of uh, William Wordsworth and Robert Frost. But then Gerard Manley Hopkins is a nature poet who exhibits such fervor for nature and for everything in nature. He sees nature as the manifestation of God's glory. And this particular poem called Inverse Need, I, uh, it was a chance discovery that I made because I was not exactly a great admirer of G.M. Hopkins until I started reading about him to do videos on him. I chanced upon this poem and I feel that it is one of the most beautiful nature poems that I've ever read. And today, when we talk about ecology and eco-friendly writing and about writers, the activists, who uh, speak for nature. It is strange to discover that G.M. Hopkins was a champion of nature long before people started talking about ecology. This particular poem was written in 1881 when Hopkins uh, went on a very brief holiday, a couple of days or so, into uh, the Scottish Highlands and uh, somewhere in the surrounding areas of the beautiful Loch, Loch is the lake, Loch Lomond. And he wandered deep into uh, the, um, the woods and forests and he followed the river that was flowing. And this particular poem was written inspired that, by that experience. Let me read the poem. It's a very short one in his usual style. Inverse Nade. This darksome burn, horseback brown, his roll rock high road roaring down. In coop and in comb, the fleas of his foam, flutes and low to the lake falls home. A wind puff bonnet of fawn froth turns and twindles over the broth of a pool so pitch black fell frowning. It rounds and rounds despair to drowning. Decked with dew, dappled with dew, are the groins of the bray that the brook treads through. Wiry heath packs, flitches of fern, and the bead bonny ash that sits over the burn. What would the world be, once bereft of wet and of wildness? Let them be left, oh, let them be left, wildness and wet. Long live the weeds and the wilderness yet. So what a beautiful poem and what an ardent plea to spare nature, to, to just let nature be, to let the wildness and the wet and the wilderness be. Let's not pollute the beauty of nature with industrialization and the smoke and the chemicals. So what a soulful plea to preserve nature. So now let's look at the poem. This darksome burn, a burn means a stream and he uh, looks at the stream it it is a violent stream flowing in turmoil so the color of the soil on either side is horseback brown because he is walking through a path maybe by the side of the stream so he talks about the color of the path the horseback brown his roll rock high road roaring down so roll rock high road so what he's talking about he's talking about the path of the stream and it is a high road which is roll rock so it is a combination that uh, Hopkins has uh, made so it is a rock it is a high road a highway through which the river roads down rolling rocks as he passes okay so the river is personified as a person and the water flows through coop and comb so in coop and comb the fleas of his foam so um, the foam 
the water when it flows when it flows with great force you know it is frothy and there is foam coop is the hollow the hollows in the bed of the river or in the side of the river comb is the high crests so through hollows and crests the water flows and there is the fleece the white like the fleece of the lamb the white fleece so you can see the foam which looks like fleece and the water it flutes and low to the lake falls home and then at a certain point the river flutes means it kind of divides into lines of thin lines of water it folds into lines of water and it falls down a rock it falls into the lake that's why to the lake falls home so it has finally reached home after a long journey and at that place where the stream meets the lake he says he he describes that place and he says a wind puff bonnet of fawn froth turns and twindles over the broth of a pool so pitch black so it is a black pool there because the it is a deep lake and so the water uh, is dark it is black in color because maybe uh, sunlight doesn't really seep through and the rocks on either side the wet rocks are black and so altogether the water appears black and uh, uh, there is this fawn froth so he he compares the spray of the water the spray of the water that rises because of the force of the uh, river falling into the lake at that point there is a spray a strong spray of uh, of water of water droplets and uh, he compares it to a wind puff bonnet the bonnet is the a kind of a cap that women wear so it looks like uh, a wind puff a, a bonnet that is filled with wind of fawn froth because there is white color and it resembles lace because of this foamy kind of a feeling and uh, wind puff bonnet of fawn froth fawn is light brownish because maybe the water is brackish it's got mud mixed in it and turns and twindles over the broth so turns of course we know twindle it is a coinage of hawkins himself it is said that it might be a combination of twist and wind and dwindle okay so the water twists and twines and dwindles so that is why he calls all together he has uh, into one word he has merged all these things and he calls it twindles over the broth of a pool and look at the comparison of the water in that pool with the smoke it is actually the spray but it looks like a boiling cauldron like a witch's cauldron where you have uh, a broth that is boiling and seething so turns and twindles over the broth of a pool so pitch black fell frowning now fell is the high hills on all the sides of the um, of the lake and so the fells seem to be frowning at the river that is falling into the the lake and the water twirls and turns as if in despair uh, like like it is drowning dead with dew dappled with dew so dead means sprinkled sprinkled with dew dappled again dappled is spotted sprinkled with dew are the groins of the bray uh, bray again is the hillside the hillside or the valley so the groins he means the two sides of uh, the valley uh, it is all scattered and sprinkled with dew the dew of the flowing uh, river of the roaring turbulent uh, noisy river and uh, the other groins of the bray that uh, bray it is pronounced as bray okay that the brook treads through and on either side of the stream uh, there are different kinds there is such rich uh, flora there uh, you can see all kinds of plants there wiry heath packs so you have uh, um, crowds of heath plants growing in thick packs that's why he calls them heath packs and flitches of fern flitches again of a fern here he's talking about the dried fern which you find on the rocks in the rainy season the fern would look maybe uh, green but then now this is dried up so you have clumps of fern that is brown yellowish brown golden brown 
and the bead bonny ash. Now that again is a beautiful word, bead bonny. So um, ash tree is a tree that uh, that has red uh, berries. So uh, and the, he says what he intends by this single word bead bonny is that the ash tree with its red fruits looks very bonny or beautiful and the fruits look like beads. So just look at that bead bonny ash that sits over the burn. So there is a, a, an ash tree full of red berries that is kind of bending over this uh, flowing burn. And he, is, uh, he presents such a beautiful picture and then he suddenly asks the question quite startlingly. He asks, what would the world be once bereft of wet and wildness? Let them be left. So he says, what would happen to this world if such burns were no more? If there were no bead bonny ash trees, if there are no uh, heat, pla heat packs, if there are no lakes, what would happen to the world? Can you even imagine that kind of a world? And so that's why he asked the question, what would the world be once bereft of wet and of wildness? So he implores to humankind, let us leave nature as she is. Let them be left, oh, let them be left, wildness and wet. Long live the weeds and the wilderness yet. Okay, so that's how he ends the poem, with an impassioned plea to uh, spare nature, to leave nature alone, to uh, love nature, to prosper at her own pace and in a, her own design. Now, uh, when you uh, look at what he's trying to tell us, I guess now um, Hopkins is a man, uh, was a man who lived in cities too. And so he knows the pollution in the cities. And again, he is a Victorian poet. And we know that the Victorian era was an era which, uh, which saw the kind of a confluence of industrialization and progress. And there was this doubt about whether science is greater or God is greater. So all that questions, turmoil uh, of the age, all that was there. And um, most of the Victorian writers in one way or the other, they try to give an expression to this feeling of chaos and confusion that they experienced. And that is exactly what um, Hopkins too is doing. He is worried about this onslaught of um, man, onslaught of uh, progress, so-called progress and onslaught of industrialization and pollution on nature and its purity. And so the request is to allow nature uh, be its own self and in that way to acknowledge the greatness of God. So, uh, as I said, Inversenade is one of the most beautiful poems I've read and uh, in my attempt to understand the poem better, I was kind of browsing through various sites and then I chanced upon a certain a blog. Uh, I, would, I, I will be posting the link in the description. Uh, so I would really want you to go and uh, see that blog. I, I say see the blog because there uh, the person uh, who, who did this blog, he has put a photograph there and he says that that is a place that he visited and when he saw the place he was reminded of Hopkins and this particular poem and he says Hopkins must have visited a place like this and surprisingly and shockingly uh, when you look at that uh, picture that this person has put in that blog you realize that this is exactly what um, Hopkins is telling uh, us about in this poem. I don't think it is the place that Hopkins visited, but then the same, everything, every detail matches with what Hopkins says. The, the pitch black pool and the bead bonny ash, the bray and the groins and uh, the moss. Oh my God, everything matches with the poem. And so, those who want to experience this poem more completely should unfailingly visit that particular blog and to, to get the full enjoyment of the poem. It gives you so much pleasure, it moves you uh, so much uh, that uh, I feel that it is an experience you shouldn't miss. So please read the poem in verse Nade and also please visit that particular blog that I have mentioned.